Πάει στο δύο Στη μακασία πάει στο τόπο. This next thing, the next 45 minutes, we'll just look at uh, what science is telling us about the medicating of youth diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I don't know, in the U.S., we're, it's about 10% of our children now that are diagnosed with ADHD. What are you in Denmark? Maybe 5%, something like that? Are you getting up there? 3%? Just wait. <laughs> You'll catch up. <laughs> I think this is a really important question because obviously the children are not consenting. And this is, you know, with adults, adults can choose with antidepressants. Antipsychotics may be a little different, but no child is saying this is what they want. This is what is basically uh, being told they need to do. Obviously, children have developing brains. And so if any area of, of psychiatric medicine I think we want to be sure of, it's with the medicating of children. And what we'll just do here, a little bit about how the diagnosis came, uh, some of the studies, and then looking at the long-term effects once, once again. Before 1980, uh, you did hear some, there was some use of Ritalin and other stimulants, uh, really Ritalin in the United States, for a condition called minimal brain dysfunction with children. But there was no attention deficit disorder diagnosis. Um, I was, when I was in, in high school, which I don't know, a century ago or so, um, there were, of course, I didn't know any kids diagnosed with minimal brain dysfunction and medicated. So it, it begins to happen in the 70s, but it's after this diagnosis that it really takes off. Now, what happened in 1980 is the American Psychiatric Association uh, published the third edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, it was also the time when they changed their conceptions of mental disorders. So if you look in the first two manuals, DSM-1 and DSM-2, there were a lot of psychological theories, a lot of Freudian influences. And with DSM-3, they decided, as a, as, a, as a professional association, to adopt really a disease model. And they'll say, we'll make these constructs, and we'll say that these constructs are defined by certain symptoms, and that once you have this model, then anything that diminishes those symptoms is seen as an effective treatment for, quote, a disease. Now, the important thing is, if you go back and read DSM-3, they say that these, are, these constructs, such as this new one, ADD, it's a hypothesis. We're going to hypothesize that there's such a disease, and then hopefully in the next 10, 15, 20 years, we'll identify, we'll validate this disease. And you might validate it by finding the pathology, that sort of thing, maybe some genetic uh, links. But it was born as a hypothesis, and not because they had identified any characteristic pathology of a certain group of kids. You'll see it gets born in 1980. We get DSM-3R, a, re a revised division. They, they loosen the criteria. They loosen the criteria again in 1994. But basically, if you look at the cardinal symptoms, you'll see, suppose they have trouble staying focused in school. They fidget in school. They tap their feet. They talk too much. Really, it is a diagnosis for sort of failure to adapt well to the classroom. And you think I'm laughing here, but at least in the United States, that's where the diagnosis generally arises from. It's from teacher complaints, your kid is uh, disruptive in the classroom, not paying attention, or just not doing real well. You see the second a little item here about the difference and who is more likely to get diagnosed? So Canada did a study, and what they did is look at kids diagnosed with ADHD, and then they grouped them by how old they were relative to the rest of their class. Because at least in, in, in Canada and the United States, you have basically a year difference, right? Between those who are the, f the oldest kids to enter a grade and the youngest kids. And what they showed is, it, it goes along a line, the oldest kids in the class are the least likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, and the youngest kids are most likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. It's partly a maturity question, right? The younger kids are paying less attention. And you'll see we're now over 10%. So 
There's a construct, and they basically say, we're going to say that if the kid is fidgeting too much, talking too much, we're going to call that a disease. The next question is, can we find the pathology of these kids so diagnosed? And you'll see 1991, we're just not finding it. We're not finding a clear neuro uh, an, uh, anatomical basis. Here in 1997, they looked at efforts to see if it was caused by a chemical imbalance. Now, the way the chemical imbalance theory of um, ADHD arose, it had two parts in the United States. One was, again, understanding what stimulants do. So what do stimulants do? Stimulants block the reuptake of dopamine from the synaptic cleft. Therefore, they are dopamine enhancers or accelerators. So they hypothesize maybe people with ADHD have too little dopamine. What did they find in unmedicated ADHD kids? They just didn't find it. So they actually had a big conference on this, but you'll see this textbook says, we just haven't found it. They had a conference on this. You'll see, and by the way, when they bring together this conference, it's people who have been researching the biology of ADHD want to find something. I mean, they, they're believers in this, but you'll see, we still haven't found it, 1998. And this last thing I think is really important, the, the, this last consensus statement. You will often hear that they've done scans and they'll say, ah, oh, these ADHD kids, their brain works differently. You've probably heard this, right? You might see a scan. When they actually looked at this, they said, yeah, but that's within medicated kids. So when we're seeing differences, is that really what we're seeing as a brain on medication, or is that the ADHD brain, so to speak? And you'll see when they looked at this, what did they say? Virtually all of these studies are, that, that show differences, they're, they're not accounting for the factor of medication. Okay, you'll see this. As a diagnostic, et cetera. On a, it's, let's see if I got one more on this. And this is the confounded medication. So they're saying, have we actually identified a biological abnormality that really helps us diagnose? Us, diagnose? No. And then they're acknowledging that the differences that are reporting haven't tried to account for this confound of medication. All I'm saying is, we've been doing this for, th watch this. To our knowledge, no controlled trials have examined the effect of stimulant medication on structural brain abnormalities in youth with ADHD suggesting a critical area for future research. My question is, since you know the drugs change the brain, why aren't you doing this research? I mean, it's 30 years. So are you really interested in finding out what's supposedly different or not? I mean, I think this shows a real absence of really trying to understand what's going on. Because obviously the medications are an important confound. So it's 2014. Do we know any characteristic biology abnormality of kids diagnosed with ADHD absent the confound of medication? And this is by the American Psychiatric Association, okay? This isn't critics or anything like that. They're saying we don't have that. So, going back, this is the same slide. Kid goes on a, a stimulant. It blocks the, the reuptake of dopamine from that synaptic cleft. What do you think the brain does from what we learned earlier? The brain's going to compensate for that dopamine, increased dopamine. It's going to compensate in two ways. The presynaptic neurons will now release less dopamine, at least for a period of time. And the receiving neurons, the postsynaptic neurons, will decrease their density of receptors for dopamine. So it will drive the brain into a subsensitive dopamine state. Does that make sense? It goes back to this of how the brain tries to compensate for the presence of the drug. And you'll just see, here's what we, we just talked about this, this sort of compensatory adaptation. One thing that is interesting, cocaine and methylphenidate, methylphenidate is Ritalin, when they've been studied by researchers, they, they note that they have basically the exact same mechanism of action and with the same potency. So cocaine blocks the reuptake of dopamine, and that's why it's dopamine release is good, we feel good when dopamine releases. So does methylphenidate. The big difference between methylphenidate and cocaine is cocaine is cleared more uh, quickly from the brain, whereas methylphenidate is longer lasting. So in a way, Ritalin is long-lasting cocaine, so to speak. By the way, this 
research on um, saying that uh, methylphenidate is like cocaine comes from uh, Nora Volkow, she's the leading sort of researcher on drug abuse in the United States. So again, this came from very mainstream psychiatry. Um, my favorite, uh, when my children were growing up, you could go into your pediatrician's office and it went like this. If you buy methylphenidate Ritalin on the street, that's probably bad for you. But if you get it from your doctor, then it's good for you. <laughs> Literally said this. Okay, this is what we're talking about, this compensatory adaptation. You'll see this decrease in dopamine release, increase in, um, again, this is a, 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 an effort to clear more dop dopamine. So you're basically driving the brain into the sub-dopamine state. Now, when you give these to rats, here's a little bit of worry. So you give methylphenidate to a rat when they're going through puberty. You'll see this drop in dopamine receptors. Now you take that rat off the methylphenidate, you let it have a, a regular rat life, you, you, then you sacrifice the rat, and you'll see that you'll still see this uh, uh, abnormally low density of dopamine receptors. Now it's a rat, it's not a human. The human brain may be very different, but you can see here in this animal study some concern that with, if you drive the brain in a way, uh, sub-dopaminergic state during puberty, could it persist into adulthood? And we'll get into some data why there may be some worry about that. So, they ran studies going back to the 1980s. They give people methylphenidate, and what do they see? With great regularity, they do see and observe in a change in behavior. The kids move around less, they talk less, and they do seem better about fo focusing intently on a very narrow sort of thing. So like an arithmetic problem or whatever is the problem, especially if it has any sort of rote, rote mechanism to it, like arithmetic, um, repetitious thing, they do better at that. And you'll see here, 1995, they're, they're describing how do stimulants uh, change children. And you'll see, they reduce activity, finger tapping, that sort of thing and classroom disturbance. So that's one way to assess the effect of drugs on kids. This is another way. So psychologists went in and said, let's measure some other functional areas. Do they play as much with others? No. Now, is that good or bad? You can see there's a subjective element there. This is the same thing, right? They're, they're actually not engaging as much with other children, but in some ways, that's the classroom disturbance part, right? But uh, in that way of evaluating things, that's seen as a positive. But here, reduction in initiation of social interactions, subjectively, we might question whether that's good for the child. Reduces a child's curiosity about the environment. Child loses his sparkle. Medicated children often become passive, submissive, socially withdrawn. This is sort of looking at the children through a different lens, sort of a more humanistic, holistic lens. Now, the, the last one I think is, clue, is key. Stimulants curb hyperactivity by, quote, reducing the number of behavioral responses. In other words, they're becoming less, in, in, a, in a global way, responsive to what's going on in the classroom. Now, next. What do we really want to see in children when they're put on stimulants? We want to see that they're doing better academically, right? I mean, I think that's what parents want. They want to see their kids get good, better, better grades. And what did they do when they initially tested this in the 1970s? You'll see, yeah, better on sort of really repetitive tasks, but not on uh, these more complex tasks like reasoning, problem solving, creative tasks. You'll see what the second one said. And the bottom line was this after one decade. The major effect of stimulants appears to be an improvement in classroom manageability rather than academic performance. In that line, you're seeing the teacher likes this kid better. Okay, but whether you're helping the kid is another question. So, by the early 1990s in the United States, we've been using these drugs at this point for, you know, 15 years. The American Psychiatric Association had done some sort of uh, cursory, longer-term studies, and were they finding that the medications helped uh, 
kids grow up and thrive. In other words, do better academically long term, lower delinquency rates, do better in terms of marital relationships, etc. And you'll see in 1994 they concluded we don't have that evidence yet. So at that point, the NIMH mounted what they said is going to be the first well-designed long-term study of the effects of stimulants on children. It was called the MTA study, the multi-site, multimodal treatment study of children. You'll see it's heralded as we're finally really going to assess whether these medications help children over the long term. You'll see where are we now? What is our knowledge out in 1994? You'll see the third thing. At this point, we have no evidence of long-term benefit. You see this, right? Okay, now here's how the study is designed. Um, it's basically four different arms. It's either medication alone in the community, medication as alone but as prescribed by experts in ADHD, and then it's behavioral therapy or a combination of the two. And here's the 14-month results, and this results were publicized widely because it was seen as uh, there was now evidence that the medications provided a long-term benefit. It, and by the way, this is the outcome still often cited in, law, in clinical care guidelines as proof of a long-term benefit. Just so you know, it's coming from this study. And you'll see lower ADHD symptoms, and it seems like some of the kids were doing better on reading tests in that group prescribed stimulants by experts. Okay, that's what we're really reporting here. And they say, you'll see the bottom, since ADHD is now regarded by most experts as a chronic disorder, ongoing treatment often seems necessary. This is the study that says we should be keeping these kids on the medication. So it's randomized, that's your 14 month results. I will say in my opinion, it was a little bit biased against the behavioral uh, group because whereas the drug treated group got to continue to see psychiatrists for 14 months, the behavioral therapy ended like after five months, six months. And if you believe that going to see a doctor just regularly besides the therapy is helpful, one group did not get that, okay? But the study continues. It now becomes a naturalistic study. If whatever group you're in, you're free to go on drugs, or if you've been in any group, you're free to go off drugs, and now they're just gonna follow the kids. And here's what they reported at the end of three years. And you'll see this. By the end of three years, medication use was a significant marker, not of beneficial, but of deterioration. In other words, they had increased symptomatology related to those off meds, a little bit um, slightly smaller and higher delinquency scores. Two things. Do you think this result was published wi uh, publicized widely? It was not. So whereas there was a big press release by the NIMH at the 14 month results, this one was not publicized in any way. The other thing here is this, to understand this, what they really mean by this. Let's imagine this is the medicated group and this is the unmedicated group. This medicated group has actually still has scores better than at baseline, okay? So your ADHD scores are still better than you were at the beginning of three years. The point is this unmedicated group is doing even better, okay? So that's the comparison. It's not that this group is doing worse than they were initially. It's just comparative to the unmedicated group. Here's the six-year results. You'll see, again, medicated kids who stayed on the medication had worse outcomes, more, worse ADHD, greater overall functional impairment. Now, as you might imagine, the researchers were puzzled by this. They didn't expect this. And so now they began to do different analyses to say, okay, maybe the reason for the poor outcomes with the medicated kids is they were worse off, they were more severe, or maybe there's some class difference. So they're gonna try to find some factors that explain the worse outcomes. They don't find them. And they do something called a propensity analysis to do this as well. In fact, they find, if anything, what it should be the medicated group that has the, 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 the better outcomes just based on class, severity of illness, et cetera. So you can see in here um, a group that went through, tried to analyze the data, tried to explain the poor outcomes and says, we can't find an explanation for it. And you'll see this, they didn't catch up growth, that sort of thing. 
So this is William Pelham. He was one of the, he's a psychologist. He was one of the investigators. By the way, they had a, quite a fight among the investigators about, about what to publish. The psychiatrist and the psychologist really got in a fight over this. He was one of the psychologists. Now, he was afraid, frankly, to say this in the United States. He went to UK and he, he was asked, what were the results? You'll see. We had this expectation. The medicated kids would have better long-term outcomes. What did we find? We found some short-term benefit, but we didn't find a benefit on any domain of functioning. And here's, I think, the key. In the short term, medication will help the child behave better. In the long run, it won't. And that information should be made very clear to parents. How many Danish parents are told about this when medications are offered? That's the problem, right? At least it should be done within uh, this, you know, within this field of free uh, sharing of information. I can guarantee you no American parent has told this. So, the MTA study is still cited in clinical care guidelines as the best study ever done, and usually you'll see the 14-month data study showing that this is why we use these drugs long-term. But now let's go and see what other studies might be out there that bear on this question of long-term outcomes. You'll see this is a Canadian effort to see if these medications are improving long-term. They look at all the studies they can find that lasted longer than three months, and they say, little evidence for improved academic performance. Now, this was a study done by the Oregon Health and Science University. It's called a Drug Effectiveness Review Project. It's sort of like the American version of the Cochrane Collaboration. It's done by researchers from 13 different universities. They do not take pharmaceutical money. So what they did is they canvassed the entire literature they could find, all of the evidence, okay? And what do they conclude? No good quality evidence on the use of drugs to affect outcomes relating to academic performance, delinquency, social achievements. And they said, 2,000 studies, we don't have evidence, we're helping these kids long term. Then Western Australia did a 10-year study. Again, uh, the, I think the expectation was that the medicated children would do better, but at the end of the 10 years, the medicated children were 10 times more likely to be identified as doing poorly in school than the ADHD children without medication. And you'll see there was a, a little bit worse ADHD symptoms in the medicated group, higher blood pressure. What's the conclusion of Western Australia? I'll let you read it. I think you see this, different countries are trying to figure this out, and they're coming again and again to the same conclusion. Uh, this is just a short thing. Uh, Medicaid in the United States is for poor children, and uh, the idea here was some poor children were not getting access to needed care. So they did a study looking at the medicated children with ADHD who got treated versus the medicated children who were not treated for ADHD. And you'll see, unfortunately, those receiving care had worse outcomes at the end of one year. This was actually uh, pretty significant. Now, this is a really interesting study that I don't totally understand the methodology. I'll be honest with you. The, the, the context for it is this. If you, in Canada, even though they have national health care, there's differences by province. And there was, in the early 1990s, Quebec passed a law which dramatically increased access to uh, prescribed medications without a copay. And as a result of that, up until that time, their use of um, ADHD medications was consistent with other provinces, but after this, they became a heavy user of ADHD medications. And again, I do not understand the methodology, but now they follow kids. They do a long-term study, and again, you can read the outcome. Now, this is done by both US and Canadian researchers. One of the group has a, 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 an expertise in, uh, actually, economics, and you'll see it's all negative. You can read it. It's negative in terms of parental relations, delinquency, uh, anxiety and depression. You see this increase in anxiety and depression? By the way, that also showed up in the MTA study there was a higher risk of the medicated kids suffering anxiety and depression at, at the end of it. 
Again, so negative. Alan Sroof, I don't know if you saw this name. He was one of the psychologists that showed up in those very first studies we were talking about, uh, about how it affected pe kids more subjectively. So he's been studying this now his whole adult career. And here's what he told the New York Times in 2012. So we've been studying this for 30 years. Do they increase concentration? Yes. But when given to children over long periods of time, they neither improve school achievement nor reduce behavior problems. And the key is this. To date, no study has found any long-term benefit on attention deficit medication, on academic performance, et cetera, et cetera. Again, when we think about the use of medications, long-term, you want to see something on the benefit side of the equation, right? To justify the risk side. And what he's saying is after 35 years, we lack that data on the benefit side. Now, I was given this uh, uh, talk uh, in, I think I was in uh, Washington a while back, and someone said, but wait a minute. There is now a study that shows a long-term benefit, and it comes from Sweden. And what the Swedish investigators did this, is they had a database, two different databases that are gonna match up. One, they have a database of everybody diagnosed with ADHD, and now they have a database they can see whether those people were filling prescriptions, okay, so they can see when they're on medication theoretically and when they're not. And then they're gonna see while people on medication, how often they commit crimes, and when they're off, how often they commit crimes. They're gonna go to a, a crime registry, and you'll see what they reported, that they're saying that when people were off medication, they uh, did some sort of criminal behavior at a higher rate than those on medication. And you can see the conclusion here. By the way, this is not children. It's 15 and older, so it's everybody. It's 25-year-olds, 35-year-olds, and 40-year-olds. Um, you, you do see that it's not following kids, you know, from early growing up. Now, I know, so, am I being critical of this study? Yes, I am. So, but here's what my criticism of the study is. Well, one, it's not following children. But the biggest problem to my mind is this. You actually, if you dig into the study, you have three groups of patients. You have a small group that theoretically took drugs consistently, and then you have about half who took them for a period of time, and maybe went on and off, and then you have a never, the never took them group. And what they say is you see more crime in the middle group that went on and off. So the question is, are you seeing a withdrawal effect, basically? And what you would really like to see here in my, you see here in patients who had both treatment and non-treatment periods, that's the on and off, the risk of being convicted of a crime was significantly increased. There could be a lot of factors. You stop taking your regular Ritalin, you, you know, you, you go to cocaine, I don't know. But what you'd really like to see data here is along all three groups, right? The never medicated, that sort of thing. Then there's one other group, that, one other study that is now being uh, cited as showing um, a long-term benefit. It was done by um, Shire Pharmaceuticals. They fund the study. It was their researchers who did the study. So this is an in-house study by the makers of, of stimulants. Peter can comment on how accurate he thinks of the quality of these findings might be. But here's what they, here's what they said. They canvassed the literature. Now this is the same canvassing of the literature of the people from Oregon that said there was no good quality evidence. These people are saying, listen, we found 29 studies that show some benefit, 20 that show uh, no benefit, so 29 better than 20, and they say, you'll see this, treatment for ADHD improved long-term outcomes. So this now is the other bit of publication that is being cited um, as now evidence for long-term benefit. So, is there any problem with this study? And again, I suppose you can say, Maybe I'm coming at this with an, a, a, you know, a critical eye. Probably am. But you'll see. Uh, you obviously have, this is by the manufacturers of the drugs. That's number one. You can't find the source studies. They don't tell you what the 49 studies are. The other problem is this. 
a lot of times there is no placebo group in this study. There really is no unmedicated group. What they'll say in a study, let's look at their baseline scores. Now let's look at them a year later or two years later. Are they better? Often they are. But we need to see this natural recovery, right? This natural possibility. And it's missing from so many of the studies that supposedly show a benefit. All I can say is this, is present all this data to parents and let other people sort through it and make their sense of what they want to do. But I think parents need to know this, this, these different findings. Just, and I got about 10 minutes left here. And again, I think as we think about medications, what do we want to do? We want to think, what are the benefits? We've, that's what we've been going through, the benefit side. And then we have to look at what are the risks? And here are just some of the, the risks that you will see show up in different um, uh, clinical trials, et cetera. So they have physical risks, risks, you can read them. There's emotional risks, depression, apathy, that sort of thing, psychiatric, OCD. One of the, the psychiatric, I think, is a big risk. So in the United States now, about 10, at least 10% of kids on stimulants for more than two years convert to bipolar. They have a manic episode or a psychotic episode. So that's a real uh, recognized risk. And think about this, when they, can, when they convert to bipolar, they're now seen as having a serious mental illness, a lifelong illness. That's a serious risk. And we do know there's withdrawal problems. What can we learn about from animal studies? We talked about how it changed the brain. How about behavior? Well, if you give methylphenidate to rats during puberty, and I think rats hit puberty like at day 45, and I don't know how long puberty lasts, but it's very short. And then they take away the, the stimulant. What do they see in behaviors of adult rats? They see with great regularity some abnormal behaviors. And the way to basically describe the behaviors is this. The rats are less confident adult rats. They're sort of fearful rats. They're less curious. Uh, less reward seeking. One of the things they do know, one of the ways they measure this is the adult male rats are much less likely to mount female rats, which is seen as sort of a lack of confidence, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll see this also in, in uh, monkeys. And one of the thoughts here, by the way, is, and this is just, I think, somewhat speculative, but you do see this as people try to explain this. Why would this be? Well, think about it this way. The drugs increase dopamine, right? That drives your brain into a subsensitive dopamine state. So you have fewer dopamine receptors. The dopamine system is seen as the system, the reward-seeking system, a system related to curiosity. So the worry here that was voiced by a couple of the researchers is maybe you're, you're sort of damaging the dopamine state, and that leads to a greater risk of depression, apathy, less curiosity-seeking. It's speculation trying to explain these animal results. This was a summary. They looked at all the animal research and they summed up what can we learn by animal research and you can see why they're coming to this conclusion. They're seeing uh, you know, decreased sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera. And this last part means more, they're more anxious adult rats. And again, it's rats, it's monkeys. We can decide whether it's um, you know, a worry or not. This is this, some of the evidence in terms of the conversion to bipolar illness, the risk of having a manic episode. You'll see 6% stimulants. The second part is interesting. So let's say you're all bipolar children, right? We look at all the children that are now diagnosed with bipolar. Let's say there's 190 of you. When researchers look, when they looked at how did they become bipolar, about two-thirds had, you know, as, as you say, manic and aggressive reactions to stimulant medications. So it's kids diagnosed with ADHD having this adverse reaction. And you'll see again, once again, another University of Cincinnati story looking at that as well. So here's what I did on this. On this side, I just looked at the way, what are the recognized ways that stimulants arouse, arouse you? And when we think about stimulants, of course, you have an arousal moment, the drug leaves, and then what happens? You have a dysphoric moment, you sort of a dis start to crash. So here is recognized arousal dysphoric symptoms with stimulants. 
And then over here, I went to the NIMH website where it, it classified what are the symptoms of bipolar disorder in youth, in kids, juvenile bipolar disorder. And you see how they uh, map right on one of the other? The arousal is, is practically the same. The dysphoric are practically the same. So you can see how the recognized side effects of stimulants could lead to this bipolar diagnosis. By the way, we have had uh, just an extraordinary boom. In, are you diagnosing juvenile bipolar in Denmark? Are you starting to do it here? We've had this like extraordinary increase now in this diagnosis. So I tried to uh, just sum this up. Benefits. You see the short-term uh, improvement of ADHD symptoms. There's possible short-term improvement in reading, or really should be 14-month improvement in reading. That's MTA. The last one is the Swedish study. That's what I can find on the benefit side, harm side. A number of studies saying no benefit on any domain of functioning. You can see the physical, emotional, emotional and psychiatric effects. The risk that the brain's dopaminergic system will become desensitized and conversion to juvenile bipolar disorder. If parents were given this information, do you think they'd be much more cautious about starting this? I think this, this is a different way of thinking about it, right? And my big thing as a journalist is uh, we just need uh, a full, uh, full disclosure, so to speak, a full discussion of what science is telling us about this. So 1987. This is when we began really medicating kids. So in 1987, there were 16,200 children on disability due to mental illness. But now we're gonna first, we're gonna medicate a lot of kids with stimulants, and then next we're gonna start medicating teenagers with SSRIs, antidepressants, and we're gonna also increase the use of antipsychotics, particularly for behavior control of poor kids. And as this has happened, the number of kids going on to disability due to mental illness in the United States has exploded. You'll see that we're now uh, around 700,000. We went from 16,200 to 700,000. And if you follow those youth that um, go on disability at age 8, 10, 12, about two-thirds go on to adult disability at age 18. So really what you see in this data is a new career path that has opened up in the United States, and the career path is this. You get diagnosed with ADHD, or you get diagnosed with juvenile bipolar, and you have a career often as a career mental patient. And that really is a new career path. We didn't have that in the United States 30, 40 years ago. Anyway, so that's the, uh, that's really the, the review of the literature for ADHD. And all I can say from my personal point of view, this is the one time I sort of get on a soapbox. <clears throat> um, you know, we have a societal sort of responsibility to take care of our kids, right? And to nurture them and give them every possible chance to grow up and thrive. I don't see in this data that we're meeting that responsibility. That's just my interpretation of the data. So, thank you. Thank you.